Great. Well, good evening, everyone. Thanks so much for coming. Welcome to Odyssey's Ithaca Writers on Exile, Wandering, and Searching for Home. I'm Jonathan Miller, as my little name tag indicates, board chair of Ithaca City of Asylum. And I'm delighted that you've decided to join us tonight. This is the third of four readings in the Odyssey series. We'll be hearing from a pair of wonderful writers tonight, Valjina Mort, a poet who teaches at Cornell, and Raul Palma, a fiction writer who teaches at Ithaca College. And I will let Kate Blackwood, tonight's host, introduce them in just a couple of minutes. But first, I want to say a few words about the series and about Ithaca City of Asylum and about our co-sponsors. So you may remember that the Odyssey is about Odysseus's attempt to get home to Ithaca after the Trojan War. It is epic. There's a protagonist with a burning quest, a plot full of twists and turns, exotic locations, sex scenes, fight scenes, chase scenes, and confrontations with death. There's a memorable cast of characters, including heroes and monsters and gods. There's some weird family dynamics, a faithful dog, and a perfect Hollywood ending. It, it's no wonder that the Odyssey has been such a popular model for novels and movies and video games. In a way, it is the universal human story because we all set out for, from home. We all try to make our way in the world. We all confront tests and temptations and monsters and death. And we all try to find our Ithaca. Art and literature help us understand that we are not alone in that journey, that the characters and settings may be different, but we're not the only ones struggling to navigate between the opposing gravitational forces of the larger world with all its opportunities and risks and the attachments and entanglements of home. And so when governments or paramilitary groups or religious groups censor, harass, shut down, lock up, torture, or murder artists and writers, they rob us of our stories too. Which brings us to Ithaca City of Asylum. We have two main purposes. The first is to offer safe harbor to writers and artists who can no longer live or work in their home countries. We try to catch them early in their odysseys, the four cyclops and the sirens and the terrible choice between the whirlpool and the rock. <laughs> Once they're here, we try to help them do their work and share it as they see fit. And the second purpose is to make noise from time to time about the importance of free expression and the crucial role the arts play in society. This reading and this series speaks to both of those objectives. I'm glad we're doing it and I'm glad you came. If you're inclined to support us, that would be great. Also, uh, we'll put a link in uh, the chat to our donations page. I want to thank our sponsors tonight. In alphabetical order, they are Buffalo Street Books, the Cornell Migrations Initiative, Global Cornell, the Ithaca College Department of Writing, Odyssey Bookstore, Storyhouse Ithaca, and the Tompkins County Public Library. This is such a cool town. You can see why Odysseus was so, uh, so intent on getting back. Thanks also to Katie Fontana from the library, who's pushing our buttons in the control room tonight. Now, it is my pleasure to introduce our guide for this evening's program, the writer, actor, and ICOA board member, Kate Blackwood. Thanks, Kate, and thank you all for coming. Thanks so much, John, for that welcome to everyone. And thank you for inviting me to moderate this reading and conversation tonight. I'm really excited to introduce everyone to Valjano Mort and Raul Palma and to hear from them read their work aloud. Um, the best way to watch tonight is to watch in speaker view. So you will find the view icon at the top right of your Zoom window um, because Katie in the control room will be highlighting us as we read and talk. Um, Valjina will read first and then Raul, and then the floor will be open for questions. So please, um, we're looking for audience questions. I'd love to hear what you want to ask the readers. So put your questions in the Q&A, um, for the Q&A in the chat at any time during the reading. Um, so reading first tonight is Valjina Mort, a poet and translator born in Minsk, Belarus, 
She is the author of the poetry collections, Factory of Tears, Collected Body and Music for the Dead and Resurrected. Her work has appeared in the Best American Poetry, The New Yorker, Poetry, Poetry Review, The Prairie Schooner, Granta, and many more publications. She has been honored with the Bess Hoken Prize from Poetry and the Glenna Lucy Prairie Schooner Award. She teaches in Cornell's creative writing program and she writes in English and Belarusian. I've had the privilege of writing about her marvelous new collection, Music for the Dead and Resurrected, and she will be reading from that collection tonight. So go ahead and um, we'll listen to your reading. Good evening, everybody. Thank you so much, Jonathan. Thank you so much, Kate and Raul. I'm looking forward to your reading. Thank you so much, Ithaca, for hosting us and for having this very important organization. Uh, here in Ithaca, I come from a country where writers have lived in exile for decades, where writers were executed, imprisoned, where books are banned today, this week, last week and Belarusian writers are living right now in exile all over the world. So I really hope that um, uh, this program, Ithaca City of Asylum, would also get resurrected <laughs> to, to its proper status. Uh, so uh, writers could be hosted here so that stories could be told because uh, this country is not surrounded by silence. It is surrounded by many, many stories and voices. I've been, um, my book came out, my third book came out in November and I've been reading it like this on Zoom. Uh, this is tragic. <laughs> <laughs> There's no, no lonelier place than to sit before a laptop, uh, right before tuning in to a reading. Um, and um, so I'm going to read a poem that I have not read yet during the Zoom events, and it will take up the whole time of my reading. The compensation for listening to such a long poem is that it is poem written in prose, though I insist that all I can write is poetry. It's called Baba Bronya. If you're following me in the book, it's on page 52. Um, Otherwise, just hang along. It will end, I promise. And uh, um, the poem begins on Pravda Avenue in Minsk. So during this quarantine time, I'm uh, having you travel all the way to Belarus. Pravda is a word that is translated into English as truth. Um, and the avenue on which I grew up was named after the newspaper, a Soviet propaganda newspaper, ironically, though unironically called truth. Baba Bronya. On Pravda Avenue, four women protect 60 square meters of our family, Pravda. In the apartment building that stretches for two bus stops, I'm a test child exposed to the burning reactor of my grandmother's memory. In the first decade of my life, I receive a full dose of her, your, pravda, truth, as a daily injection. When in the winter dark, I complain about having to go to school, you bring up 1941. You had just finished fourth grade in a Minsk orphanage. The first day of war puts an end to your education. What would have become of me if not for war? It is impossible to imagine you as anything else but a Pravda teller of your life. As I eat my lunch, you talk with gusto about hunger. When I complain about my unfashionable clothes, you laugh remembering your wedding. You borrowed a white robe from a nurse to wear as a wedding dress. When I beg for privacy, you ask 
Did I tell you about the day the Bolsheviks came to take the roof off our farmhouse? Or worse, did I tell you about the house where my mother died right after sending my brothers and me to an orphanage? Did I tell you about how Uncle Kazik died? Did I tell you how the Soviets took my father twice? And since he did return after the first time, I didn't cry a bit when they took him the second time. Later, you did cry abundantly when Stalin died. You remember the names of all our dead relatives and know the distances between the burned down villages. You remember childhood rhymes and the exact dates of non-consequential occurrences. A bee stung your great uncle Leopold in the eye on July 11th. But you never remember that you have already told me these stories before. Have I told you about the story of my life? You'd say at night from your bed. Three of us share one bedroom, my sister, you and I. My parents sleep on a sofa bed in the living room. I've never set foot inside a second bedroom. When I feel unwell, you talk about your leg that doesn't bend in the knee. A stick instead of a leg. Right before the war, you are scheduled for a kneecap surgery, but the bombings cancel all plans, and for five years, the knee rots. It is a miracle that in the end, the leg doesn't have to be amputated. In the first month after the war, waiting for the surgery, you sit in the garden of Aunt Victor's house when a soldier on his long way home stops by the fence. Beautiful, would you pick me a flower? He asks. All your stories feature this moment whether it is a story of hunger, bombing, exile, sickness or death, somebody always stops by to tell you how pretty you are. Unable to walk by yourself silently, you keep to your seat. Before leaving, the man says in your most dramatic voice, your eyes will haunt my dreams. I was ashamed to reveal that I was an invalid, you explain daily. For me, your stories, pravdas, replace real life. These stories keep me inside them like in a circle of fire. As I grow older, you make sure I stay chained to a listening chair with an accordion. You help fasten a large red Beltmeister on my skinny shoulders like a stone sinker. I sit on the bottom of your stories with an accordion holding me down. Have I told you about how much I live inside your Pravdas and not Pravda Avenue? Neighbors found out about my, find out about my accordion before my parents do and bang on the wall with a shoe. In a small, stinky elevator, some neighbor often asks me if I'm that accordion girl and stares at me silently all the way up. Once, giving my best to another etude or waltz, out of a corner of my eye, I notice a tall figure standing in the door of the living room. She's an old woman, much older than my grandmother, with distinct features on a clear face. She's a total stranger in our apartment. This woman is my grandmother's aunt, Branislava, Baba Bronya. It turns out that Baba Bronya has lived with us in our 60 square meters for all the seven years of my life occupying the second bedroom. My grandmother takes food to her room and cleans after her. Neither of Bronya's sisters wants Bronya, so she ends up with us on Pravda Avenue. Bronya's two sisters, Victor and Yadia, along with her nieces, 
all Yadis Yanina's and Amelia's, never forgive Aunt Bronya for having a good time during the war. In the pictures I find years later, Bronislava stands surrounded by a man in uniform and seems about to go dancing or have just returned from a dance. Above all, Bronya is hated for never having children. When you do not have children, you do not have to see them die one after another during the war. I marvel at your ability to account for the exact causes of deaths of various children in the extended family. You recite them like recipes. Yedik three meningitis, Yanachik one diarrhea, Boliska five in a bombing. Let's not cry, you tell me. Victor cried until her dead children in their afterlife almost drowned in her tears. Almost drowned in her tears. Why not? You're always reliable for casually dropping facts about the afterlife, as if you could enter and exit the afterlife right from your kitchen. Have I told you about how much I live inside your Pravda and not Pravda Avenue? When Baba Bronya, long-haired and square-shouldered, emerges to the music through the doorway, I'm seven years old and I scream my lungs out. I cannot move. The accordion pins me down to the chair. You run from the kitchen, stuff Aunt Bronya back into her room, a second bedroom. And I enter my years of nightmares and utter terror of being left by myself. I have to be walked from the bedroom to the bathroom and back. On my way from school, I cannot enter a building and stand waiting for you to notice me from the kitchen window so you can walk me in. In the best Belarusian tradition, my mother drags me to many witch doctors. An image early spring, we arrive from the city of apartment blocks in a village where a witch doctor lives in a low log house, snow pass glistens in the black humus. Black humus, snow pass, and whispers of village, village witches only increase my paranoia. Once, almost a teenager, I walk into a church seeking exorcism. After Aunt Bronya dies, my parents buy their first proper bed and move into the second bedroom. What is left of Aunt Bronya? A small stack of yellowed photographs where she stands, long head and square shouldered, surrounded by men in uniform. Have I told you how much I live inside your Pravda and not Pravda Avenue? My nightmares stop when at 16 I quit studying music. Thank you. I'm looking forward to our conversation. Thank you so much for that reading and um, both poem and story in one, I think. Uh, now we will hear from Raul Palma, who is a novelist, a short story writer, and an assistant professor of writing at Ithaca College, where he serves as the faculty advisor to Stillwater Magazine. Raul's fiction has been included in the best small fictions of 2018 and rated distinguished and notice, notable in best American short stories. He has been supported by fellowships and scholarships from the Cuba One Foundation, the Kimmel Harding Nelson F Center, the Santa Fe Writers Conference, Sewanee Writers Conference, and the Sundress Academy for the Arts. I've gotten to know not just Raul's writing, but also his teaching when a few years ago he welcomed, welcomed a, an Ithaca City of Asylum visiting writer from Nigeria into his writing classroom, and I was able to come along for a lively discussion about literature in all kinds of places. He is working on a novel titled A Haunting in Halia Gardens, and I believe he plans to read an excerpt from this tonight. Uh, 
Thank you, thank you, Kate. And I'd add uh, that these days I'm also just trying to hold on. <laughs> um, and thank, thank you, John, as well for the introduction. Vagina, that was really powerful. I'm looking forward to the conversation afterward, uh, the q and I, I, yeah, I'll, I will read just a little bit from A Haunting in Hialeah Gardens, and I guess I'll jump right into it. Chapter one. It was Christmas time in Miami, and Hugo hadn't been sleeping well, because every time he tried, he'd feel his indebtedness drop into the bed with him. This invisible thing. Sometimes it would take hold of his hand to kiss him, then wrap itself around his chest so that it hurt to breathe, or it would slap him awake and demand attention. It was impossible to sleep. It was impossible to imagine a future. He lived in an efficiency. When he sat at his table drinking tea, he could hear the murmur of another family through the drywall. In the morning, it was an espresso machine, the sizzle of bacon. The children whined, fought, laughed, dribbled basketballs. It made him feel like he lived in a real home. From his window, he'd watch them all in public school uniforms, march across the street at 7.05 a.m. to catch the school bus wild little rambunctious boogers. He'd wanted to be a father. Children were not in his cards. He was broke, there's no doubt about that. So he conceded to frugality. He learned to toss glossy retail magazines directly in the garbage. He learned to regrow lettuce on his windowsill. For work, he alternated between three outfits, which he mended frequently. And for breakfast, he drank tea and ate a single boiled egg. His only splurge? On Fridays, he'd drive to La Cajareta and order a $2.25 cafe con leche prepared by Barbara, the eldest of the cafeteria workers. He kept a quarter on him for tip. All in all, this amounted to $10 per month, enough to buy a gallon of milk and a bag of Butelo coffee. But Hugo needed this extravagance. More than the coffee, Hugo appreciated Barbara. He thought she might even be his friend. When he was around her, he'd smile and make jokes. Something of her age and her temperament reminded him of his own madrina from years ago. And because it was Christmas time, he'd bought her a little present. And after a night of terrible sleep, he'd gone to see her, even if it wasn't a Friday. The present was nothing extraordinary, just a candle from the botanica he worked at. And Hugo had wrapped it using gift paper he'd found in Melly's closet. It was nice paper, blue with white snowflakes. And even though Melly used to do all the wrapping, he did well wrapping it on his own. At the counter, Barbara greeted him with her customary, que me dice? She slid his coffee over then and said, wait a second, Hugo, it's not Friday. Got your days mixed up? I wanted to surprise you, he said. He was about to give her his holiday gift, along with a kind note he'd written, when his phone buzzed and rang and startled him badly. So Hugo excused himself and looked at the unknown number, and he wondered, should I answer it or should I let it go to voicemail? And feeling the joy of the season and a sense of optimism, he set Barbara's gift down atop the counter of the cafe, cafe window and answered, Hi, is this Hugo Contreras? The voice sounded familiar, but not like that of a friend. Hello, hello, the voice probed. Is this Hugo? With whom am I speaking? Look, don't hang up. Who is this? My name is Alexi Ramirez. Hearing that name uttered by that man, it sent Hugo way back. Him and Melly curled up in the bare down of their bed, the murmur of Ramirez's late night commercials carrying them off to sleep, AC blasting even if it was wasteful. How Hugo missed those days. Is it really you, he asked. The attorney on the bus benches. When the voice chuckled and responded, yeah, that's me. Hugo took Barbara's gift and walked off, even if he hadn't sipped his coffee or paid. He paced around the lot, weaving in and out of parked cars. Then he paused and whispered, Alexi, do you know who I am? Before Alexi could respond, Hugo continued, you gotta stop calling me. What do I gotta do to get your fucking people to stop calling me? It's every day, what more do you want from me? Actually, he yelled all of this, even with some cops nearby. Hugo's indebtedness, which had been trying to latch onto him all day, slunk to the ground and pulled around his feet. He stomped through it kicking it so that it felt for a moment as if he'd actually conquered it once and for all. Alexei didn't hang up. He waited for Hugo to stop There's yelling. An active call. <laughs> it's my Alexa. Then uh, he waited for Hugo to stop uh, yelling. Then like someone used to being despised, 
He proceeded to delicately explain why he'd called. There's something in my home, he said. I can't describe it. I think I'm being haunted. He said other things too, about Hugo being recommended to him by Ludas. Excellent compensation. Hugo took Barbara's gift, sat in his car, even with his indebtedness crawling on his skin like worms. He said, I'm sorry, I won't help you. In Miami-Dade County, most people remember him as the traffic ticket attorney with the bus bench ads. He was something unfortunate to stare at during the monotony of rush hour, though he gave Hugo and his wife something to laugh about. The ad was so dramatic, like a bad yearbook photo. Alexi fat, bald, posing with his clenched fist under his chin, an angry American bald eagle squawking wildly behind him. It was a kind of face that made you want to stop your car and doodle something inappropriate all over it. What could Hugo say? When Melly got a ticket going 15 over the limit, it was Alexi's firm that got her off with a small fine and no points. And there was even something of the jingle, how it play incessantly during television commercials. It was so memorable that when Hugo Lee suspected it, he'd sing it. But Alexi was no traffic, no longer a traffic ticket attorney. It took Hugo and Melly quite some time to notice when, in 2015, his bus, bus bench ads began to deteriorate or bleach in the sun. Those that remained scattered through the city were in bad shape, marked up with mustaches and penises. Melly noticed first, where'd our friend go? Mira, Hugo, the ads are disappearing. She was so shocked that she called his traffic ticket clinic right then and there while sitting in traffic. She put her phone on speaker so that Hugo could hear that we're sorry, you've reached a number that has been disconnected or is no longer in service. I don't believe it, she said, we need to find him, bro. Ask Siri, Hugo said. No, Melly said, not him. Who cares about him? We need to find his face. In rush hour, they searched Miami. It was nonsensical. Something about finding Alexi had infected them, much in the way that searching for a lost set of keys can drive a person mad, even when the keys are in their pocket all along. It was clear to Hugo that finding his face meant something more to Melly. And though he grew tired and hungry, he persisted until they did find one of his bunce bench heads completely intact, no mustaches, no penises, just a piece of gum on Alexi's nose, which Melly easily scraped off with her fingernail. In plain sight, Melly, who was such a joker, said, how do you think he'd look with hair? Then using a red permanent marker, she proceeded to conjure up a little hairdo, all spiked up in the front. It was ridiculous, yet it brought Hugo and Melly such joy to deface him. Afterwards, they said their goodbyes and for years forgot him until the phone call started. Hugo would be out with Meli, usually at Isla Canaria eating Cuban food and making fun of their newly elected orange-faced abomination of a president, when Hugo's phone would go off, even if it was 7 p.m. on a Saturday. In those situations, Hugo would pretend that he didn't hear the ringing, that he didn't see the phone vibrating off the table, that he wasn't aware of the patrons staring, wondering why doesn't he just answer it? He'd cut into his steak and continue speaking to Melly like it was the most ordinary thing. And Melly learned not to ask who'd called. She tried to teach him how to silence the phone, but even that made him uncomfortable. Back then, Hugo's indebtedness was like a mosquito splattered on his car's windshield. It annoyed him, but only mildly. It was easy to ignore. It only took a little blood. Hugo knew about the statute of limitations. He knew there was no reason to pay the $2,000 he defaulted on during his 20s. He knew that the original creditor had long ago sold the debt to a third party. The creditor had ridden off the loss to reduce the tax burden on significant profits on other accounts. It wasn't like he'd taken money from another individual. He'd taken from a corporation that had anticipated in its business plan that some debtors like Hugo would eventually default. This is to say, and so that it's quite clear, Hugo had zero remorse. He did not feel guilty at all. As far as he was concerned, he'd always been in debt. He was indebted to God the day he was born. Carrying such debt was, in his mind, like forgetting that you were also made of flesh and bone. But he hated the phone calls. He hated how invasive they were. Melly would pretend not to notice, and Hugo hated that he was putting her in that situation in the first place. That one time she'd taken his phone to put it on silent, he'd seized it back and said in public, don't touch it with such a force that Melly looked as if his words had slapped her. His words made her cry. How he wanted to simply be free of his past blunders, to go about life with nobody hounding him about debt, 
to be an unbaptized child, forgotten by God and devil, and belonging only to himself, which is why one night after he'd looked at his savings account, he answered the call. It was bold. He was in bed with Melly, watching reruns of Minister Bean and eating popcorn. And when the phone rang madly, he answered it and said, won't you cut it out? The way he said it with no warmth really startled Melly because she nudged him and whispered, what's gotten into you, dude? On the line, a pre-recorded message noted that the phone call was an attempt to collect the debt. It was a message on repeat, vocalized by someone for whom English was not their dominant language. There was something menacing about the recording, the way it repeat again and again, all staticky and silvery, as if it were just some transcript reverberating endless in some metallic void. In fact, the recording reminded him of the complex and frayed speakers within the mine he'd once worked in a lifetime ago, and how the supervisor would announce lunch breaks and shift changes, and always in a voice that was distorted and far off seeming. Hugo could almost see his brother's face, soft under the glow of the many oil lit lanterns. He didn't want to go back there. When the deck collector finally came to the line, he said, hey, asshole, it's Sunday night. The young woman on the line said, sir, I'm sorry to bother her. Oh, Hugo said, no, I I'm sorry. Am I speaking with Hugo Contreras? I was spending time with my wife, you know, he said. Is this Hugo Contreras? You know damn well it's me. Melly smacked him, whispered, yo, do you really have to speak that way? He took the call to the kitchen. The speaker said, I'm calling regarding your Bank of America credit card debt. I know, I know. Can I just pay it right now over the phone? Yes, great. I can walk you through the payment options. I just want to pay. But sir, are you going to take my checking info or not? Of course, Mr. Contreras. How much would you like to pay? Hugo told her he'd pay the $2,000. He gave her his checking info and he asked her to mail him a receipt. That night, he jumped back into bed with Melly and he felt liberated, exercised of his past financial missteps even if he'd blown through half of his savings. He kissed her, climbed between her legs and told her what he'd done as if he'd conquered a mountain, as if the many peaks and walls and barriers surrounding him had fallen away to a celestial halo. That was so stupid, Melly said. We could have gone to Disney. He disagreed. Being debt free was worth it until he received a receipt in the mail. It showed that he still owed $12,476. The law firm had calculated 16 years of high interest and they tacked it onto the debt. He called incoherently, disputing the amount and refusing to pay, always having to listen to that pre-recorded message on loop. That lost voice damned to repeat its lines. What the firm did was the crime, he thought, yet they sent him to court and the judge ruled in their favor. The statute of limitations had reset when he'd made a payment. It was as if he'd opened his door wide open and invited those vampires right in. It was the law, invitation only. By the end of the year, Hugo's wages were garnished. The little he made at the Botanica was less. With a high interest, Hugo knew that he'd never pay off the debt. And it angered him how the missteps he'd made in his life could haunt him forever. He didn't want to talk about it. Melly wished that he would. Maybe Hugo could have forgiven Alexi for that mess. But when he and Melly experienced the hardship of their lives, Alexi came for them all over again. Melly was gone, and the phone calls were becoming incessant, this time for another kind of debt. Hugo had, without fully realizing it, co-signed on Melly's hospital bills. Through the wake and the funeral, he ignored the calls. He allowed them to ring out because he'd never cared to put his phone on silent. Still, he wanted to be in the present, to say his final goodbye and to remember Melly in all her radiance. But with the ringing and Melly's Aunt Lena shoving him and saying, have you no respect? And with the priest reading the rites and giving Hugo the side eye, there was no peace. On the road nearby, a dozen or so motorcycles revved their engines. Overhead, a traffic helicopter hovered. It was so ordinary. Afterwards, nobody wanted to leave him alone. Even Lena, who'd never cared for him to begin with, insisted on having lunch. She took his hand and said, she still lives with us, you know? And Hugo nodded and said, no, she doesn't. Why would you say that? We just buried her. When he left the cemetery on that morning, finally alone, he got home and checked his mail. There was a certified letter from the law offices of Alexi Ramirez and Associates, the only correspondence. Hugo opened it and what he saw weren't numbers or figures. He just saw one word, collect. 
which seemed in that particularly dark moment to be an attempt on his soul. He drank too much that night, or not enough, because when he woke up the next morning, he saw Alexei's court summons again, and sitting there across from him, where Meli would always take her coffee, he saw it, his indebtedness, as hot and as bright as a Florida sun. In that one moment when he confused it for Meli, it flared and scorched every bit of hope and optimism right off Hugo's body forever. And then it vanished, just like that. And Hugo wondered stubbornly, fuck, how much did I drink last night? But what he didn't tell anybody, and what he certainly didn't admit to himself, is that he'd seen that vision before. After some reflection, in fact, he realized that it reminded him of home. At La Cajreta, Hugo was getting ready to hang up when Alexi blurted out, listen, I think we can work out a deal. You help me, and I'll clear your debt like it never happened. You help me for real, and I'll clear all of it. You can be mad, but think this through. I mean, if your boss says you are what you are, if you can cleanse my house so it's spirit free, I'll clear all your debt. Sitting idle in the parking lot, Hugo did pause to consider Alexi's proposition. In his emotional state, he didn't have the language to give his thoughts shape. Could Alexi really do such a thing? What of my emotional debt? And what of my debt to Meli? Instead, Hugo felt his indebtedness, the way it suffocated him at all times, the way it infected every aspect of his life, every free space, every new relationship, an invisible thing, but which felt somehow opaque and as solid as a bank vault at the bottom of the sea. And feeling the pressure of his indebtedness, Hugo said, sure, I'll meet you. Thank you, you all. Thank you so much, Raul. Um, I want to keep listening. <laughs> is that the first chapter of the novel? Yes, yes, it is. Okay, chapter. so that's that's the opening. Yeah. Um, well, I noticed that place plays a very important role in both the readings we just heard. As I listened, I felt like um, I was in Miami and in Velginas, I felt like I was transported to Belarus um, and back in time <laughs> for that matter to a different a different era. Um, and so is the sense in both pieces that place is not merely physical or geographical. What migrations do both of you make or talk about in your writing, um, either geographical or emotional, relational, and what real life experiences are they based on? I, I, I could go first. I was catching my breath a little bit. Yeah. <laughs> some tea. <laughs> but uh, I would say, um, you know, Miami is such a, a prominent place in, in my imagination when I write. Um, but, you know, thinking about uh, the theme for tonight's reading, thinking about, um, you know, Odysseus, right? And something Odysseus always had was there was a home he couldn't arrive to right in the end. There was this suggestion that eventually, you know, there's a place you can come to. Um, for Hugo, who's, who's in fact, um, you know, he lives in Miami, but he's, he's actually, he originates from Bolivia, right? But he migrated to the U.S. at such a young age, he doesn't even remember it, right? So, so his origin is essentially this blank canvas, or not, I shouldn't say canvas, it's kind of this, this void, right? Uh, and he feels no affinity for, where, for, his, for his origin. Miami for them, for him then becomes this kind of, you know, I guess the only place he, he's really ever known. Um, and for Hugo at the point of telling, right, there's, there's nowhere that he could really settle on. Um, you know, there's no, there's no home to return to. There's, the idea of going to Bolivia is, you know, an impossibility. Um, and, you know, there's no recovering from debt at the, at the moment of the story start. And then in addition to that, with the death of his wife, um, there's, there's a sense of uh, claustrophobia, I think, at least when I'm thinking about him. Uh, so, so I think of Miami in those terms, right, as just like this bustling, amazing city, and yet there he is in this, in this efficiency, you know, just utterly alienated from everyone and just utterly hopeless. Um, well, you know, uh, Zoom, Zoom is funny like that. You go silent for half a minute and it feels like the event is a failure. <laughs> 
<laughs> radio silence that radio <laughs> yeah. DJs deal with. <laughs> um, well, uh, um, Raul brought up uh, Odysseus and um, I uh, was uh, rereading the new translation uh, uh, by Emily Wilson, and uh, she points out in her introduction, really makes it apparent that um, Odysseus returns home pretty early in the book. <laughs> so, so the idea of the physical return uh, is not what Odysseus is after. Yeah, that there is a home that is inside of us, as, as Raul was saying, um, once you leave it, you cannot uh, quite go back. Mm -hmm. And uh, once a migrant is always a migrant. Mm -hmm. um, and um, mm -hmm. so, uh, but also speaking of Odysseus, I actually, because I was uh, jo listening to Jonathan in the introduction, saying that Odysseus is the, the poet who is overcoming all of these uh, monsters, but mm -hmm. I I do not think that Odysseus is a poet. I think that sirens are poets, not Odysseus, because sirens, sirens scream in this inhuman voice, which is what poets do, um, scream into the void, but we're trying to do it in kind of the most human civilized way. <laughs> <laughs> it's possible. And then Odysseus is so meek. Yeah, he has to be tied to, to, tied to the sheep and then they put wax into his ears. I mean, what kind of siren would not be heard through the wax in the ears? So, you know, something is off with that moment. And it tells you, it tells you that Odysseus is not a poet because a poet hears a poet hears with wax in the ear or not, um, and a poet um, does need to be tied because the poet ties, um, and but also screams. So the poet would welcome, would 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 sail by the sirens in sisterhood <laughs> and in celebration. <laughs> so I think that. My, my odyssey is in search of the sirens so that I can sit on the edge of a cliff with them and finally become myself, you know. <laughs> Otherwise, I find myself sometimes at home kind of mooing, <laughs> yeah, and doing some strange sounds. And then I think, well, finally, I sound like a human being, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> because everything else feels like a very wooden, wooden language. I want to note that you are a poet and you have maybe played the siren for us tonight <laughs> um, by telling us the stories, uh, story of a story being told to you. So maybe sirenness is a, a series of people telling stories to one another. Um, I would love to share a question that we have from the audience. Chris Gonzalez asks uh, specifically to Raul, could you elaborate on the English word debt and its Spanish translation, Debo? I'm wondering, he says, what meanings might be lurking in the Spanish word that we don't immediately hear in the English? Um, it's funny you mentioned that. Um, I, I, I know I have some students uh, in attendance tonight, and we've been reading um, Giorgio Gumbin's Creation and Anarchy. We moved through a few of the lectures uh, and there's one lecture in particular, uh, I think it's something along the lines of uh, what is a religion as capitalism, right, uh, in which it, it ties debt to faith in a really fascinating way, right, um, that uh, walking, there was someone walking through kind of ruins in ancient Greece and saw written, you know, on the ruins themselves, I think the word was uh, pestos or pestis, right, which signifies debt, but also signifies faith. Right, which I found so interesting, um, because with that debt as well, um, there's I think there, there's uh, there's clearly uh, it's it's clearly in a negative category in our moment, right? Like this idea of uh, indebtedness. Uh, I mean, it's all over the news, and I think it's it's uh, easy to forget that there are some ways in which certain debts can also be seen in a positive category. The debts we have to one another in a society. The um, 
you know, and, and what it makes capable. It, it's really, um, I find it, um, you know, just such an interesting concept, almost otherworldly. Um, and yet it has the ability to ruin us and, uh, and also uh, make things possible in some way. Uh, I don't know if that answers the question entirely, but um, what is it? Uh, I, I would say that in English and Spanish, uh, now it's probably, it probably leans into the negative category a little bit, uh, at least in, in casually, you know, in Miami. Well, this, um, that leads into another question that we just got from the audience. Um, the question says, I'd love to hear both Raul and Valjana talk about the debts we inherit simply by being born. Um, well, um, I mean, it's a very large philosophical question. So what I'm going to do is that I'm going to take it down onto um, um, the level of the history that I come from. And um, I, though I do not, I, I, I call this history, I never use words like deaths or uh, trauma, um, simply because I come from a, a rather different narrative, but it is fascinating to, to hear and to listen. Um, I come from a legacy of uh, violent deaths, right? That's, that's true of a lot of people in Eastern Europe and in other parts of the world too. Um, and uh, um, you know that there's for uh, 200 years, there was nothing but war, nothing but persecution, nothing but executions. And um, you are a survivor, uh, you are born only because one person has survived miraculously usually by chance and uh, and so you trace your lineage and all of um every person is somebody who dies a natural death who, somebody who dies at the hand of another human being um and um, that's something that I return to a lot and that's something that obsesses me a lot I do not perhaps this is the word for me, the word is obsession, is not that. But I'm quite obsessed with this idea that I come into a culture, I'm born into a culture, into a legacy where ordinary sadness is a privilege. The ordinary sadness of saying, well, yes, people die, people grow old and die, somebody gets sick and dies. That's the kind of ordinary sadness that is reserved for very, very few people in the part of the world that I come from. And so there is great longing in me for ordinary sadness, for ordinary joy, uh, right? Uh, just yesterday in Moscow, a Belarusian politician got, uh, who traveled there for a meeting got arrested by Belarusian KGB and for some time he was just missing, right? He became unavailable. And, and then once it was uh, known that he is actually arrested by Belarusian um, KGB, there was a moment of joy among his friends because it meant that he was not dead. It meant that he was looking hated yeah and so and then of course after this moment of joy we step back and we say but what is this joy right what is this kind of reality in which the fact that a man is arrested by kgb is a joyful moment and so um my longing and the longing out of which I write is a longing for um not not deaths but um uh, not, uh, you know, poking a finger into a trauma um, and saying, look at me, I suffer because I come from a tragic place. But from this really deep and um, vulnerable longing for an ordinary life and ordinary sadness and ordinary happiness. And I'm on mute. There we are. Um, thanks. Thank you for that. And to the next question, I actually have two questions I hope that we get to, to get to from the audience because they're both excellent. Um, the first one is for Valjana. 
Um, and the question is, um, it's related to what you have been discussing, what you just said. Um, the war plays a central role in your poem, and it does understandably in the work of other writers from your country, such as Ellis Adamovich and Svetlana Alexievich, who was a guest of ICOA some years ago. Um, do you expect the theme of war to continue to remain strong in Belarusian writings, or it will fade with new generations of writers or be represented as memories of older generations, as in your poem? Uh, thank you, Matthew, for knowing two Belarusian writers and two really great ones, Alessia Damovic and Svetlana Alexievich. Thank you for reading them. Yes, World War II is the foundational myth and wound um, of for Eastern Europe. Belarus was occupied for three years during the war. Every third person and died during the war. Uh, our cities were Jewish. There was Holocaust by bullets in our cities. There was depopulation uh, in the countryside that was called depopulation. It was the genocide of the peasants. Um, and um, so whole, whole country was bombed down and burned down. Um, and, um, but then it was also every year we celebrate the victory in World War II, uh, the Soviet people who have, um, and it is true, uh, where the, the crucial, played the crucial part part in uh, stopping Hitler in Europe, something that is always underplayed in um, American history lessons. Uh, the problem is that we have not learned to mourn, that uh, we celebrate victory. We do not celebrate the day of mourning. Uh, we do not celebrate the day of loss. Um, and um, the sacrifice is seen as justified. Um, and the motherland uh, means more than a life of a human being. And if needs to be, millions are ready to be sacrificed again, as we see during the victory marches in the Russian Federation today, when people march with posters that say, we can do it again. Um, they mean we could win again, we could wage a war again, forgetting that millions died in that war. And in Belarus today, when a whole country is held hostage by a madman while the world watches and cannot do anything, um, the metaphor of the World War II is the go-to metaphor. And we're constantly using the language of fascism and Nazism, occupation, torture, the um, main prison in Minsk um, uh, is uh, often called uh, Auschwitz, the present day Auschwitz. And one could, there is already a lot of argument about how we're using this language. Um, yet it's the only language we have. <laughs> That's our foundation and here we are. I again, our children again watch their parents beaten on the streets. Uh, they do not understand why their parents are in jail, why they do not return home, why the teachers uh, force them to wear a uniform and get photographed with weapons in their hands because they're little warriors. You know, it's this narrative does not leave us. I'm going to stop talking because it's such a big subject and it's really horrifying what's going on. Yeah, thank you for just that small look into it and perspective into um, what's going on. And there are so many questions I want to ask both of you, um, but we have time for just one more and I'm, it's on a different topic altogether, the topic of language. Um, let's see if I can find the question. Um, yes, the question is, um, for both of you, how do translation and your translation work influence your own writing? Uh, so Raul, let's start with you. It's so funny, you know, um, it ties into an earlier question uh, about being born with debts and all of that. Um, because my grandfather, when he was living, when he would read my translations of Spanish, he'd just kind of like shake his head and he'd say, <laughs> That's English. <laughs> you say it's Spanish, but it's English, you know. Um, and 
you know, I, I begin there um, because, uh, you know, Sp I grew up in an exile community and Sp Spanish is what I've got, you know, um, and, uh, and I don't have a, I don't have a really strong grasp on it. Um, right. But it does give me a window into thinking, uh, think it just helps me think differently. And when I use it, um, when I use it in my fiction, um, it's, it's because it has, I feel like it has to be there. Like it just, that's the way the, the, the community that I come from would say it uh, along those lines. Uh, and it also feels uh, exciting in some ways, right? To write, uh, I know this is going to sound uh, a little insensitive, right? But to write knowing that I'm creating these kind of blank spaces for some people, right? In the text that, that are in, that you, you kind of, uh, they're gonna, it's going to take some work to access, right? There's something of it, um, I think maybe because I work in English so much that uh, that just kind of gets me excited. Yeah. And uh, Belgina, how about you and uh, language? Yeah, translation is a foundation and fundamental to my being in the world and uh, my becoming as a writer, like Raul, from what I hear, um, I'm a foreigner in every language I speak. Mm -hmm. I grew up reading um, and speaking Russian, which is a colonial language for me, a language of great violence in, uh, imposed on my country. And I never tried, despite speaking it, writing in it. And um, now when I'm right now translating a Russian poet into English, um, it is for me all about uh, just crashing together two imperial languages against <laughs> each other. Yeah. <laughs> But um, but I feel how removed I am from it as a poet. It, I have no claim on it and I don't want it. Um, and then Belarusian I learned, uh, not even learned, we just kind of, it's assumed at one point that one, one is supposed to speak it, yeah? And so my Russian and Belarusian are very, very imperfect. Even more imperfect is my English in which I live. And then I always try to learn a little bit of another foreign language. It is my way of being in the world um, because untranslatable is my comfort place. I'm most comfortable in a place between languages in those kind of marginal underutilized linguistic spaces. And um, I cannot imagine how one could be a monolingual writer. Or it, it, you might write in one language, but how do you think only in one language? I cannot quite uh, grasp it. Like Raoul say, is saying that is, um, it's another way of thinking that is available to you. And I'm constantly going in between. It is very much a... a um, emo emotion and be being in constant motion between languages. That's wonderful to hear. I mean, wonderful in the the deeper sense of um, pondering what language means to a writer. Uh, thank you both so much for sharing your readings and your insights. And um, I'm going to wrap the discussion up right now. Um, thank you so much for everyone to everyone for coming. And I want to um, invite you once again to support Ithaca City of Asylum and our work. And also come on May 18th um, for the last segment of the series. Uh, when, so May 18th, 7 p.m., Min Fang Ho and Kenneth McLean will be sharing their work and their life experiences as well. Um, thanks so much, everyone, and have a good night.